Eyes Without a Face is a horror classic from 1960, about a mad scientist kidnapping young women so he can steal their faces for his disfigured daughter. It's a very influential film from a bold new age of horror, so let's take a look. Welcome everyone to Screams After Midnight. I'm now realising I should have got some bandages and like wrapped them around my head for the start of this, but welcome everyone. It's a horror movie podcast. I'm Peter and joined as always by Tim. Bonjour. <laughs> Do you know any more French? Or is, is, is that... Oui. <laughs> so you just said yes, but the answer is actually <laughs> no, which I think is just <laughs> nah. no. <laughs> nah. No. Yes. Yes, welcome everyone. Uh, today we are talking about a classic film. We're looking at Eyes Without a Face. Uh, this was a vote winner. Our patrons over on well, Patreon. That's where the patrons tend to be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could be a patron and not even know it. Uh, but yeah, so they, they voted on three movies. Look to your left, look to your right. If <laughs> if you don't see a patron, then you're the patron. Yes, that's how it works. <laughs> that old saying. So... Yeah, this, this was a vote for three movies that were on my top 100 that we hadn't done yet, mm-hmm. and Eyes Without a Face was the winner. It's a French film from 1960, and we'll, we'll get into it, of course, but uh, we'll, we'll start spoiler-free, just in case, you know. You, I imagine a lot of younger folk probably haven't seen this, so you can get mm-hmm. a, a sense of how we feel, uh, and then we'll get into spoilers and talk about it a bit more in depth. But uh, uh, just before we do get started, I'll just remind you, if you are enjoying the show, hit the like button, helps out a bunch if you do, more people will find us. And you can get some bonus content, including an extra episode every month over on Patreon, but I'll tell you more about all that stuff at the end. So, yeah. The basic premise of Eyes Without a Face is it's a bit of a mad scientist movie. We've got this doctor, this surgeon, who is kidnapping young women so that he can try and replace his own daughter's face, which was badly uh, damaged in a car accident. So... That's it. That's the premise. Face off. <laughs> <laughs> you think this was inspiration for John <laughs> Woo's seminal 90s action movie Face Off? I mean, the similarities are boundless, I would say. The tones, though, are very <laughs> different, I would say. <laughs> very, very, very different uh, atmospheres mm-hmm. in both films, I would. Mm-hmm. Mm. There's no Nick Cage in this hamming it up. Unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, Timmy, uh, <laughs> had you seen this before, actually, before I even ask anything else? Yeah, I had seen it at some point. Um, it, it, it's funny because this is one of those ones where if you would have asked me, I would have sworn that we had done it on the show uh, at some point <laughs> just because, uh, again, if I mean, guys, we've been doing the show so, so long now. Uh, I can't keep I mean, I can't even remember the shows we did last year, but um, that's a fair but point. I, yeah. I, I felt like we had talked about it at some point before, but maybe I'm just thinking of like, you know, bringing it up on like a, you know, top whatever list or, or something. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure when, but I, I know at some point I, I seeked it out. Most likely I was probably doing some type of, oh, uh, you know, filling in the gaps of like whatever, you know, people say are like, you know, the best horror movies of all time. Or maybe I saw like, you know, I'm trying to think. Maybe uh, I would. Be, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Stephen King might have mentioned it in his uh, uh, Dance Macabre book, which was kind of his writings on like the horror genre, and he talks a lot about different movies that influenced him stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was mentioned at some point there. Um, but yeah, it, it'd been a while since I'd seen it, but I, I had seen it before. Um, honestly, I didn't really remember too much other than basically the look of the. Um, I don't know if I, I want to say necessarily the villain, but you know the woman with the the, the titular eyes without a face. Uh, I guess you'd say. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I guess just to go into my my thoughts here. Uh, yeah, I, I I guess I'll probably sound like a little bit of a, a cretin because uh, uh, I I don't hate the movie or anything, but I, I I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily like in love with it. Like I think it's fine. Um, it, it's one of those ones where. Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand why, you know, it it has its rankings and, you know, uh, horror history and everything. Um, but, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it necessarily moves my world. Uh, I, I do think, 
they're I, I mean these type of movies that I, I for me at least I, I do have to be in a particular mood so um I, I did watch it yesterday after a long week of uh work and, and traveling so I wasn't probably the best headspace to watch it and uh, I don't know it, it was a, it's not a long movie but it was a little slow at, at parts and obviously it's you know uh pretty old which isn't necessarily like a bad thing I, I don't want to sound like a uh yeah, <laughs> some uh, uncivilized brute that they can't watch anything, you know, uh, older than the 90s. But but it, it was, you know, it did have that old timey feel that was a little slow uh, at, at some parts for me. But I think what, you know, and I'm uh, going to assume this is probably, you know, why it ranks so highly among most people. The thing that, you know, uh, does save it for me from, you know, just kind of writing it off uh as being some old stuffy, you know, movie is, uh, you know, I, I do find the, the look of the, you know, the, the woman with the mask and everything to be, you know, quite haunting. Like there is a very creepy, uh, look and aesthetic to it. And I do find the last, you know, uh, I guess third or, or so of the movie, uh, to actually be pretty en enthralling once kind of everything is going down. Uh, there is actually some good, horror and mayhem and, and stuff that's going on uh so yeah i, I guess that's kind of where i'm coming from mm. <laughs> you bring this to me on episode mm -hmm. 580 of this show mm -hmm. you you come to me with this this <laughs> horrible take i've had to sit mm -hmm. here and listen to you defend leprechaun movies and i think i think we are recording on the anniversary of leprechaun 2 just <laughs> What? to put it out there <laughs> how do you know that no one did. i'm sorry are you are you everyone's subscri talking about it no 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 are you subscribed to some sort of weird <laughs> leprechaun fan account that is just every time there's a, an anniversary like they get eight of them a year because there's eight <laughs> leprechaun movies like hey it's the anniversary of leprechaun <laughs> like in space today oh it's in mm. the hood 2's anniversary today these are important dates <laughs> They are not important dates. They are, <laughs> they are stricken. In fact, everyone with a birthday on any of these dates should change their birthday to the day before or after, so they don't have to share a birthday with the stupid leprechaun movies. Uh, I, mean, I know you can like legally change your name, but I'm pretty sure I don't think you can change your birth date. <laughs> <laughs> well, they should. In fact, it should be illegal not to. Uh, yeah. Okay. I. I mean. Uh, okay, that, that was painful to listen to, Tim. Quite frankly, uh, this this movie is is very very fantastic. It's it's haunting. It's it, it is slow, but it's refreshingly slow. I I found this a delight to like watch just nice long takes of, uh, like the you know the woman in the mask like going around the house and just quietly taking it in. You know, it's obviously in French because it's a French movie, but there are large I'll stretches so. where it's just visual. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Tim. Did you have a witty retort that you you wanted to insert there? I just, no, I just think it's funny to say that it's obviously in French. Like, oh, like what tipped you off when they started speaking in French? Like, <laughs> that's what makes it obvious, Tim. The <laughs> know, word so "obvious" funny. means that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to strangle him. I'm going to strangle him. Uh, I think it's surprisingly violent uh, in a couple of specific moments that I don't think you could get away with with a movie in America I, in, in this time period. I was surprised that uh, at some of the stuff that happens in the ending. I was like, oh, wow, they're going for it there. Yeah. Well, you see the end. I think there's something right in the bang in the middle that uh, I think is probably mm -hmm. the most gruesome moment of the whole movie. And I'm like, oh, I'm surprised they, they, they showed this much and they went this far mm -hmm. with it. Because, uh, you know, the first time... They sort of hint that there's something wrong with uh, Christine's face. That is the the titular eyes, as as Tim put mm -hmm. it. Uh, <laughs> she's just sort of got her head like pressed down into like a pillow, and like they're kind of hiding it. And it's like, oh, it's going to be a kind of classy movie where we we just avoid it with like camera shots and like where we're looking mm -hmm. and all that. And it is for the most part, but it kind of it does go a bit further than you expect it to uh, mm -hmm. with that stuff at one point. Uh, but no, I think it's I think it's very well paced. I think it's pretty haunting. I think it does that sort of tragic Frankenstein s thing where you're you're kind of 
your sympathies and who you're sympathizing with is kind of challenged. There's kind of like a, mm-hmm. a beauty to it. It's, 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 you know, and it's a movie that's kind of about a lot of things. It's, it's about how we perceive beauty. Uh, Shut up, Tim. It's about how we <laughs> perceive beauty. There's some misogyny mm-hmm. in there. The idea of playing God is definitely in there. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, obviously morality is a big part of it. Like all, all these things are at play throughout the movie. Um, I will say it does feature uh, two of the most useless detectives I have ever seen in a movie. Uh, I'll sure. talk about that in spoilers. But uh, otherwise, um, I think it's a beautiful film. I think it looks great. I think the the current like version you can get of it from Criterion looks fantastic. It's uh, you know been lovingly remastered. It on... Very sharp. What, what did you watch? I watched it on Mix. <laughs> I mean, it's probably the same transfer. Mm-hmm. Was it in HD, Tim? How would I know? <laughs> it was on my TV. <laughs> what do you mean? How would you know? You did. It would be a blurry mess if it isn't. <laughs> then, well, uh, yeah, I don't think it was that blurry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't trust anything you say now, Tim. You, you, the trust has went out the window. <laughs> oh, bloody hell! So, no, I think it's excellent. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why it was on my top 100. And for me too, it had been a long time actually since I'd seen what this. What was the reason? everything that i just said <laughs> okay that, i was oh, just making sure <laughs> the, the umbrella of quality that i was referring to okay yeah this movie that is like you know a film unlike that mm-hmm. leprechaun dreck that you uh pander on about <laughs> i mean i don't know it's different tastes for different folks <laughs> i think leprechaun gives you some things that you know this movie necessarily doesn't and vice versa yeah, headache. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Do you know, I was kind of worried about this when this one. I thought, mm-hmm. oh no, I can see Tim being a right little shit about this. You put it on the list. I mean, you knew it was going to happen. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But like, I was saying, you know, but, but when mm-hmm. it got to the point where it was, oh, it's clear this is the winner. I was like, mm-hmm. oh no, this is the one where I could see Tim being extra tim well, I, I mean i think i'm being pretty fair i i, I said it's fine and it's like i said it was bad <laughs> look i'm <laughs> just trying to make this entertaining tim all right it's not going to be a fun review if you just sit there and go oh it's fine and then i just ignore you it's all right, all right yeah. <laughs> i've got to interact it's with you like... occasionally it's one of the burdens of doing this show <laughs> <sighs> yeah can't wait till um <sighs> I mean, normally I'm not a big proponent of uh, AI, but <laughs> but when we can work out the kinks and we can just get the AI version of me to do the show, it'll run a lot smoother. I don't know. I don't know if we can program an AI to replicate you, Tim. That may not be possible. <laughs> that might be what shuts uh, the whole operation down. Yeah, the entire internet is just going to mm-hmm. break if we try and have it replicate mm-hmm. the mind of you. You know what's funny is I, I did have to have a, a meeting at work um, about implementing AI to do uh, some of my functions, and my boss was basically telling me like, "Yeah, so we're hoping that we can get it to do like this, this, and this." And I was like, "Oh, okay, that's my entire job." <laughs> so <laughs> fun times. <laughs> it's a fun world uh, that we live in <laughs> right now. Hmm. Maybe replaced by an algorithm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who'd have thunk? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's just where we're going with life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, do you know what's got no AI in it? Uh, Eyes without a face because it was made in 1960. Is it, is the director still alive? Because I'd love to see him do a special edition where he just like <laughs> CGI's some <laughs> <laughs> like like a special edition style. Just I don't know, throw a you know a Greedo nah, in, the, I, in the background or something. Pretty sure he's been dead for like 30 years at this point. Oh huh? <laughs> uh, well rest in power yeah okay. our condolences to the um french family <laughs> okay <laughs> right you could have just said his family they don't have to specify that they're french i mean they probably are but i don't, I don't think it mattered oh dear um okay i'll, I'll give you a slight critique i do think uh mm-hmm. the music that plays that's supposed to be when like some stockings happening is oddly mm-hmm. like upbeat and hijinxy. 
Yeah. I'll yeah. give you that. <laughs> Some inner quibble. Yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to think, like... Um... Do... Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, like, what would be the oldest movie that has, like, a really iconic soundtrack? Because, like, I don't know, like... I mean, you can kind of think of, like, some of the, you know, like, old-timey music cues and sings and stuff that you get, like, in the, in the old Universal stuff, but there's not a lot that I feel like is very, like, oh, yeah, man, that's such a such a, a great I score, mean, that's one, you know. Psych was out the same year as this, and that's got the, I mean, you know, it's... it's that's, uh, that's definitely iconic, yeah. It's the, yeah, it's not, like, a hummable melody or anything, but yeah. the, the sharp yeah. strings as the, you know, the shower curtain opens is, is pretty iconic. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I I didn't realize that uh, yeah, Psycho was was at the same time as this. It's actually interesting because yeah. Psycho is often like credited as being, hey, it's the horror movie that took it out of like Transylvania castles mm -hmm. and stuff like that and put it in the modern world. And I think it's mm -hmm. interesting that this does that too. This is you know this is about women being kidnapped out of Paris, uh, and taken to a sort of nearby, you know, house that's just on the outskirts mm -hmm. of the city, like. This yeah. is set in the modern world. This is like real people, you know, relative to like the time it was made in, like being kidnapped. Like so, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I it, it does have that thing though where it's like, you know, <laughs> uh, America is very uh, self centered. So probably like, well, I mean, that doesn't count because it wasn't <laughs> American. <laughs> I think uh, the I, I think I was gonna add some stuff about this on the Wikipedia. I, I think there was. They did bring it over to America, but like I think it was like a couple of years later. I'm assuming. I don't, well, actually, I don't know if they would have like dubbed it at this time or what they would have done. But uh, I assume the American version is not uh, that good, or at least as good as this. I mean, it depends if they change that, I suppose. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I think I mean, if if nothing else, it just kind of shows that the the direction was moving in the same way all over the mm -hmm. world that they were doing more contemporary horror stories uh and you know horror wasn't seen as like a mm -hmm. classy the... genre at the time you know i mean to hell arguably it still isn't but certainly at the time <laughs> it wasn't as common to do horror movies unless you were just in like cheap little nasty things so mm -hmm. the fact that this is Cause... quite classy and feels like really masterfully directed much like psycho mm -hmm. uh is uh really sticks out because yeah. and then uh so then that means uh, Peeping Tom would have been around the same time as well, right? Because wasn't that around the same time as Psycho? Let me just double check the number on that. But uh, yeah, it's about the same. It's definitely, yeah, it's 1960, same year. Yeah. Well, so, so, and that's and that was a, a British. Yeah, film, so that's and we've got an American, a British, and a French right. hmm. movie all from 1960, all doing present day, like modern horror movie stuff. Interesting. Which doesn't sound obviously special, but today's stars up. Most horror movies right. come out and they're mm -hmm. set in the present day in the everyday <laughs> world. But it was really common before this for everything to be, yeah, it's all castles, it's all set back in like mm -hmm. olden times or, you know, that kind of thing. And it's all that gothic, yeah, like dark and gloomy uh, kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't know if people are going to be able to see this on, on the video. Are they going to see the little, the arrow that's on there? Okay, you just moved it. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just making sure. I, don't, I wasn't sure if people uh, people end up seeing that or, or not. Well, I mean, now I see it, uh, you know, in the overlay and stuff. But before, it was like... Oh, wait, no, no you can't see that. No, you're... So, okay. so Tim, Tim is being distracted like a cat because he can see my mouse <laughs> cursor moving over the video feed that I'm sending him. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I... Yeah, I didn't want people furious that they would that there was a cursor on screen <laughs> not, not, to, not to worry not to worry right. uh that's not being recorded that's just been sent to you remove it in post i'll remove it in post though we've got okay. a cgi budget Fantastic. I'll, I'll... <laughs> right after i put in the uh, cgi version of you <laughs> Yeah, I mean, honestly, yeah, we'll probably just say spoilers and, and get into it. But mm -hmm. clearly, Tim's not as into this, but I, I would highly recommend seeking it out, especially if you like older mm -hmm. movies, uh, especially if you like kind of slow-paced, thoughtful cinematography. 
uh, it's it's actually a really simple plot, all things considered. But I, I think it it's, it's it's very very good. So, spoilers for Eyes Without a Face. You have been warned. Um. Yeah. And I thought. Was, uh. Yeah. The spoiler section might be a little interesting because I, I was kind of surprised that. Not that I want to say like, very little happens in this movie, but but you know it, it was kind of a very like straightforward plot. Like there isn't like a ton of you know, I guess, twists and turns or like, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's part of its strength, I think, is that it, it, it's, it's more about dealing with, like, the impact of each moment than it is about, mm-hmm. like, trying to swerve you left and right. But it is interesting, because if you go into it completely blind, and I kind of spoiled this in the spoiler-free section, but it's because it's the general premise of the movie, but the movie doesn't let you know that his daughter, the Doctor's daughter, is alive, that Christine's alive. Mm-hmm until about 15, 20 minutes in. Like, we spend some time uh, with the, the public story because as far as the public's aware, she's dead. And that's kind of mm-hmm. what the first 15 or so minutes of the movie are, are kind of about. And it's kind of funny because that's the opposite of Christine where, like, the opening scene is you finding out she's alive. <laughs> are you referring to the car movie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Cinema's <laughs> second most famous Christine yeah, we haven't done Christine on the show yet. We'll have to. <gasps> we haven't. No, believe it or not, we oh, haven't. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, we'll it will probably wait a couple of years till uh, I can watch it with my son. He loves cars, so that maybe that'll be a good <laughs> horror movie. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. So mm-hmm. sometime after the ten year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, because the opening of the movie. Uh, is so uh, this character uh, Louise, I think her name is, uh, who's like the the assistant to the doctor. She mm-hmm. is driving down the street, and there's someone in the back seat. But it kind of becomes clear that the person in the back seat's not alive. It's just like someone with like mm-hmm. hat and sunglasses on, and they're kind of rocking about. And she's effectively dumping a body in the river, in the river Seine mm-hmm. specifically. And this body's found soon. And the one of the first big scenes of the movie is that our main doctor character uh, is brought in to identify his daughter uh, because mm-hmm. this woman is missing her face, right? Her skin is missing, right? Around her eyes and around her cheeks and all that. And they bring him in mm-hmm. and they also call in another guy whose daughter has been reported missing. But the doctor gets there first. And when he sees the body, he identifies it as his daughter and that he's sad. Mm-hmm. And the story that he's sort of selling here is that his daughter was so depressed about what happened to her in the car accident and she lost her face that she is seemingly committed suicide. That's like a dark thing, but it was just like kind of weird. Like, I mean, I, I guess it could have a, like what kind of car accident just like leaves you pretty much completely intact except for your face. Like it just perfectly rips off like your face. Well, I don't know if it was actually ripped off. I mean, was it could it be burns or something? Like our face mm-hmm. landed in like fire. Or gasoline that was on fire, or something—I don't know, like a like a Harvey Dent thing, but mm-hmm. the whole face, like one face. <laughs> she drove into some acid. <laughs> uh, so no, but I think what's really great about this scene is that he's very quick to identify the body, and when he's on his way outside the police station, uh, the other dad who was called down, who clearly mm-hmm. you can kind of infer by this point this has to be this guy's daughter because he's lying mm-hmm. or well if you know the premise you already know that christine's alive but mm-hmm. what's so good about this scene is that this dad is like oh did you really look at her and you're sure it's your daughter and he's like yes i'm sure and it's very like quiet the doctor's quite cold with them and i love that it works really well because <laughs> you get that the doctor's feeling guilt in this scene or mm-hmm. You can argue that he's not feeling guilty per se, but it's awkward because he's effectively this is the man whose daughter he stole and murdered to try and like give awkward. his own daughter a face. That that's like I think that's a really strong scene, uh, and then from there you follow him home, uh, and it, you know it goes through the whole motions where he gets into the the garage, he gets out of the car, he goes up the stairs, and we follow all these steps. We follow him going up the house because it's building to the reveal, which is when he gets to the bedroom and he starts talking to someone on the bed, we find out that it's the daughter. She's still alive. Christine's not dead. Mm-hmm. And that this woman who was dumped in the water is someone that they kidnapped. Uh, and it's something we're going to be seeing his assistant 
uh, Louise do throughout the movie. She's going to go looking for more victims, and that's that also mm-hmm. starts quite quickly after this point. We we sort of learn around this part of the movie that, or, we, or I say, and when I say learn, we kind of infer because Christine, mm-hmm. you know, doesn't like. She's clearly not happy with her situation, but we get this like beautiful set of sequences with her where she just sort of starts to go around the house, and one of the motifs of the movie is her with doves, and there's, she looks up at a painting mm-hmm. of herself with doves, and uh, Louise gives her her mask. You know, she's been hiding her face. She puts on the mask, and it's kind of like a big reveal when you finally the camera finally turns around and you see her wearing the mask for the first time because it is kind mm-hmm. of a haunting image, and is one of the inspirations for a lot of things, but including. Michael Myers, like the shape's mask, oh sure, yeah. is is very much a, an evolution of the mask and eyes without a face. Mm-hmm. This is obviously more like a hard shell, so it looks more like a like a doll face almost or something like that. It's almost uh, boy esque, you could say. Why why have you got to ruin this? <laughs> why do you have to ruin this, Tim? What, what, what the, I'm sorry. Did, did did I like I don't know. <laughs> murder a, a close friend or something <laughs> what have I done I mean if you have to ask yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've done nothing to you nothing. I, I, I will agree though that, that is I, I think this is uh, definitely the at least for me that the highlight of the movie is just this whole look is uh, very creepy very haunting uh, as you put it like anytime she's on screen pretty much doing anything in this mask it is like yeah very eerie and chilling and that it, it and it works um and uh i think especially in black and white this is just like this look is kind of made you know for for black and white i don't think it looks yeah, really yeah. good uh, yeah the movie looks great and it, it's as she goes through the house and she's kind of looking at different things like one of the main themes of the movie because I, I mentioned she looks up at the painting and she's got like the doves or whatever on her uh, later on you see her with the, a bird cage and the doves are in a cage so it's all kind of representing that much like the dogs that the dad the doctor mm-hmm. uses to experiment on to practice his skin grafting uh, mm-hmm. that she also feels that she's trapped that she's an experiment that she's not free that she's not alive that she's already in some way dead <laughs> so that's like a big part of this and when she gets to like eventually the end of this long trek throughout the house like it's, it's her at the phone and she picks it up and she calls someone. And I don't think I got the first scene, like who she, who it was she was calling. It wasn't until the later time she calls him that I got she was calling her fiancé because she was engaged when mm-hmm. this car accident happened. And the fiancé thinks she's dead. That's something else we learned because they have like a funeral for her and the fiancé mm-hmm. is there shaking hands along with the dad. And he's like, well, that's that, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess this is what happens when you have this horrible accident that disfigures your face, but your dad happens to be this experimental, like, skin grafting, like, surgeon. So he gets all these de- yeah, that's del- what happens. delusions of grandeur. <laughs> He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix her. Um, I mean, yeah, thank God, like, if he, like, if he was just a dude that, like, could do ass transplants or something, then, like, she'd be screwed. <laughs> <laughs> she would have just big ass cheeks for yeah. her face yes um, well i also Maybe if we make the ass big enough it'll distract from the face i i like the idea though that like they never intended in doing this whole faking or death thing that mm. was only because they found this other woman's body and they had to like explain it and be like oh mm-hmm. that's my daughter yeah that's her so mm-hmm. you know so now she's officially dead yeah so I don't know, I like that. I like that was just them improvising. Uh, <laughs> but it, it does call into question the, what happens when you kill anyone else, which obviously does come up in the near future. So Yeah. Because <laughs> it's around here, um, we're introduced to two detectives who aren't doing too much yet, but they do introduce this woman who was picked up for shoplifting, who happens mm-hmm. to look a lot like uh, the you know Christine and all of the women who are victims. Because that's the thing. They keep going after women who have similar hair, similar faces, blue eyes, which is interesting. And I think this is intentional. I don't think this is a mistake because part of my brain goes, why does it matter if they have the same hair and the same eyes? Because you're not transferring mm-hmm. any of that. You're only taking the skin of the face. So what does it matter? Yeah. The, the skin complexion is the only thing that really matters in this case. I mean, maybe overall shape of the head mm-hmm. perhaps as well. But I think this is sort of going into the theme of like the idea of the movie about the vainness of all this and like mm. no no it has to be a beautiful woman who's beautiful just like my daughter 
for, for this to work. It has to be someone who's on par when in reality that's that's, that's like that doesn't mean mean anything. Like you're not taking their eyes, you're not taking their hair. Like, you know, uh, so it just it just kinda of points out how superficial like a lot of this mm-hmm. actually is when you, you stop down and think about it. So yeah, I mean, the doctor is, you know, excuse my language, but just a, he's a grade A jerk because, you know, any, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think any, uh, you know, father worth his salt would say that, you know, that, that it doesn't matter what your your son or your daughter looks like. They're always beautiful in your eyes. Instead, he says, get used to wearing your mask. <laughs> <laughs> you freak. <laughs> I can't take you to Notre Dame <laughs> looking like that. Yeah, because that's where French people go <laughs> to do things. <laughs> Not for that. Um. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, yeah, he's you know he is like he's an outright kind of villain. Like there's moments mm-hmm. where he's supposed to show remorse or like where he'll say, "Oh, I've done some horrible things to achieve this miracle." He says that at one point, but there's never mm-hmm. any real sign that he's going to change or or anything. He like, he clearly is just this way. And there's a, oh, yeah. if if anything, he's actually less likable or more villainous than even like a Doctor Frankenstein is. Because mm-hmm. as bad as what Doctor Frankenstein does, and like him playing God's a big problem in that story, he's only taking dead people's like parts. He's not. Yeah. He's not like ruining living people and keeping people prisoner. Right. Yeah. And then obviously, like once he unleashes his monster, he like you know feels remorse and, and yeah he learns what he's yeah. done yeah yeah no nah, so whereas this guy this guy is just like well all right that's uh the you know fifth women woman we killed uh let's go find another one yeah and that's kind of louise's thing is we see her like stalking the streets of paris and she finds <laughs> the next victim and we see her befriend her and be like hey i've got an extra ticket for the opera or whatever it is <laughs> and then she's like hey by the way i know you're looking for a room to stay in in the city i found one uh, so in this house just outside the city, I'll take you there. I know the owner, and I, I like. I think I was thinking, oh, there's going to be more of like a a prolonged thing here where she's staying in the mm-hmm. house for a couple of days or something before they finally strike. Like they're prepping for. Her. Uh, mm-hmm. Instead, no. Like she literally comes in and says hello to the guy, and she can tell this woman can tell something feels a bit fishy about this, and she's trying to make excuses to like just leave as quickly as possible, mm-hmm. but. Daddy Doctor just chloroforms her, and that's it. She's out. Uh, uh, you know, t- they take her to his secret uh, operating room, which is behind like mm-hmm. a, a closet in the garage, and like hooks her up. And we see the process. And what one of the things I really like actually is that uh, there's other versions throughout the movie of the eyes without a face. Um, one of them, of course, is this woman after she's had her face taken, she's in bandages and you can only see her eyes. Oh, yeah. But another one that I thought was nice and subtle is actually, and it's more natural, is Louise and the doctor, when they're doing the operation, they've got the face masks on and the caps on. They're basically only showing their oh, eyes. Yeah. And it was kind of like a, <laughs> a comparison with the others. Because I think another big part of the movie is the idea that the doctor's always hiding his true face. That as much as his daughter's the one wearing the mask, He's wearing the more insidious mm. mask, and it's not until the end of the movie when his face is mauled by dogs where you're like, <laughs> "That's who he really is. This yeah. is the monster that he actually is." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah, I don't want to ruin you making fun of the movie, Tim, but I've got to actually say nice <laughs> things about it because it's good. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I I can't argue with that. That's uh, some good stuff <laughs> in there. <laughs> um. I, w- I will say uh, I I do always love a uh, a good bandage look. Uh, so I will <sighs> cat scratch me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I did think you know that was cool. And then uh, one thing that's kind of neat is like you know we're talking about how this is bringing you know kind of horror into like a more modern setting for the time, but it, it kind of feels like a nice little bridge because stuff like you know kind of like the hidden laboratory and stuff it still feels like it has a little bit of that old mm, you know kind of yeah. like spooky castle or, or gothic feel even though it's like kind of you know merging it with like this more modern stuff so that was interesting yeah it's a little bit more high tech and even the fact that this guy mm-hmm. is a plastic surgeon effectively or well, maybe that's not quite exactly yeah. right because he's not doing mm-hmm. like botox or like 
not what it was written <laughs> about. But he, like, he, he's he's a. I can't, well, I can't even say he's just charismatic, because I suppose mm-hmm. technically his entire thing is like helping people with damaged skin. So that's different, of course, than just someone mm-hmm. who goes and gets something done because they feel like a change. But, yeah. but even that feels very modern, right? I can't imagine that was that old. Uh, like, well, maybe it is. Maybe there was like, you know, older versions of this type of practice. But it feels like a fairly right, modern like a idea. Bit, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, this is where we get to like the, she's on the operating table and like they're drawing the the outline of where they're going to cut and it's like okay this is kind of creepy mm-hmm. and uh, but then he gets a scalpel and he starts actually cutting and it's mm-hmm. a simple effect because obviously it's just the classic thing where they're shooting out a little bit of blood at the tip of the blade so that it looks like mm-hmm. they're, they're making this like incision but I'm like even if, even this for 1960 feels kind of like yeah. extreme. But then, then, then he actually starts like sort of peeling at the, the face, and like mm-hmm. Louise, the assistant, is like putting the clamps on the edges of the face to like hold it mm-hmm. up. And I'm like, this is actually going much, much further than I would have imagined, you know, before I saw it. Like, it it's just it's a That's lot true. more yeah. graphic. Um, and they do a smart thing where as they take the face off at the end you only kind of get a glimpse of what's underneath and then it fades to black. So it gives you just, just mm-hmm. enough to get your imagination going, uh, which actually we glossed over but before the operation. Uh, Christine wanders in to the operating room. She finds the area and sees her on the table. And she looks oh, yeah. down at her and the the girl wakes up and sees her uh, like standing over her without her mask on. And it's actually the first time we get a glimpse of Christine without her mask on. And it's but it's always out of focus and kind of blurry. So you can see they've put mm-hmm. makeup on her to make it look like all damaged. But at the same time, it's never quite in focus, so you can really get a good look at it. So it's like they're sort of hedging their bets and be like, okay, we may not have and they wouldn't have said this at the time because they didn't know who Tom Savini was. We don't necessarily have Tom <laughs> Savini makeup here, but we can, you know, play around with what we've got and make it look as good as it can in the in the right light. Not to distract, but yeah, something that was weird was that I just noticed on my uh, search bar on my computer, I, I thought there was like a little eyeball on there. And I thought it was like, oh, that's so weird that <laughs> we're talking about this, you know, very eye centric movie. And there's like a little eyeball on there. But then uh, when I kind of, you know, physically zoomed in <laughs> uh, with my head, I noticed that, oh, it's uh, actually the. Um, I guess it's supposed to be an eclipse. Like it looks like the sun, with like a, yeah, the the moon all, all blacked out that in front of it. But you know, it looked like a little eyeball. So <laughs> thanks for that, Tim. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh dear. I yeah. didn't want I didn't want anyone to wonder why I kind of zoomed in a little bit. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh... Again, you keep saying zoom in. That's how. That's not how most people would describe them leaning their head in. <laughs> it's a, I'm just in such a, a cinematic mode right now. Basically, this is the thing. Like they're happy that the, it doesn't happen on camera. It's like, but they start talking that well, mm. afterwards that they've, they've transferred the face, and it seems mm. to be taking. Louise is quite hopeful that it's going to keep. And they're like, okay, but what about this other girl? And I think her name is like, like she survived. She's mm-hmm. not dead. Unlike the other girl that we did this to. And he's like, I don't know yet, but just make sure she eats something. And we see her, you know, she's got all her face bandaged up and she wakes up. And when Louise tries to feed her, she attacks Louise, not like hits her in the back of the head with a bottle and goes mm-hmm. running throughout the house. And at this point, we haven't seen Christina yet with the new face on. And I was wondering if how they were going to handle this. Like, are they going to like, have the actress who played Edna play Christine now because it's her mm-hmm. face she's taken, like Face Off, where like oh they swap <laughs> faces. They don't actually do that. When we see Christine like a couple of scenes time, she's you know her own actress playing the role, mm-hmm. and that's whatever. But uh, yeah, uh, Edna sadly like they sort of chase her throughout the house, and she kind of like mm-hmm. goes upstairs, and seemingly uh, when she sees a reflection in the mirror, dives out the the window mm-hmm. upstairs and kills herself mm-hmm. uh which was actually really well foreshadowed earlier on because they were mentioning mm-hmm. christine was saying oh you've removed all the mirrors so i can't see myself but that doesn't mean there's not reflections like the windows show reflections mm-hmm. at certain times of day 
Uh, there's steel surfaces, there's knives that have reflections. There's lots of things that I can still see myself in. So mm-hmm. I think that's the implication here is that she saw her reflection in the in the window and chose to end her life, which is really tragic and, and sad because mm-hmm. her face was literally stolen. This is the original identity theft. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, this, like, th- this scene wasn't, um, like, yeah, th- it wasn't, like, super, it wasn't, like, gory or anything, but, um, it definitely, like, was a, a dark scene, like, again, I mean, at this point in the movie, I'm not surprised, because lots of dark, uh, things happen, but, uh, I, again, just kind of surprised that, overall, like, how <laughs> dark this movie is for, for the time. Yeah, it's not like it is super graphic. It's just that, it, like, that image looking down at the dead body on the ground with the blood coming from the head, you wouldn't think twice about seeing that in a movie, like, even 10 years later, I don't think. Yeah. But it just, I think it's because you don't see it in black and white that often. I, I feel like, uh, yeah. You know, black, obviously, there's some modern black and white movies, but mm-hmm. by and large, black and white usually means it's a, an old movie. And I feel mm-hmm. like you tend to associate that with being a tamer time. And this feels like it's still provocative in a lot of ways yeah like i you know i I love like you know the old universal monster movies and stuff but like usually in that you would just get like someone kind of coming at you like yeah that would be like the extent of of the horror like you wouldn't see like very gory bloody stuff it's yeah it's more more hokey well there's nothing Mm -hmm. about this movie that is hokey Mm -hmm. you know like it's definitely got like a sort of elegance to it, but it's not hokey in its execution, hmm. for sure. Uh, it's anti-hokey. It's an- yes, anti-hokey. <laughs> As I, it sounds like a dance movie you do at a wedding or something. Are you thinking of the hokey pokey? Well, this is like the anti-pokey, which is like the opposite of that dance. Wait, is it the anti-hokey or the anti-pokey? Uh, I mean, the anti-pokey is part of the anti-hokey dance. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so yeah, this woman is dying. And we get a whole scene here where the doctor like, and Louise take her to the cemetery where... Mm-hmm. The, you know, the quote-unquote daughter has been put in a crypt and they like, mm-hmm. open her crypt and dump this dead body in with her. And part of me's thinking, this is genius. This is a cemetery. There's maybe be dead <laughs> bodies here. This is actually the perfect place to put a dead body. Mm-hmm. Smart. I was thinking, that, you know, the perfect way of doing this is if you see, like, a fresh grave, like, one that's just been, like, dug like or filled, you could dig mm-hmm. that up, put the body in next to the coffin and then just put the dirt back in and no one would be the wiser because it was a fresh grave anyway. Like, no one would notice the thing. The perfect crime. Perfect, perfect, well, the perfect disposal of the crime. I, I don't know if, uh, the, yeah. How good the murder is is on you, okay? <laughs> I can't help you with that part. <laughs> and I'm not condoning any form of murder, for the record. Oh, no, of course not. No, 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 no. No. No, that's one thing we won't <laughs> condone on this podcast. <laughs> so... From here, uh, it, like, okay, they're happy. We see a scene where they're with Christine, mm-hmm. and she's like, oh, you're all hopeful. We kind of have to ha- send you away for a while b- and give you a new identity because you're supposed mm-hmm. to be dead. But everything's great. But then the doctor looks at her face and sort of starts to look a bit concerned. And we, he admits to Louise that he thinks he's failed. And then we get this sort of, like, still frame kind of section where it sort of shows her, like, five days later... And then 10 days later, 20 days later, so on. And it's like the skin didn't take. Like the skin that's been added starts to rot because it's not actually connected to the living tissue. Um, and, you know, so so like this promise that he gave her has, has dwindled. And now we're back to like hunting for more people. And I think what I like about this and what makes it so tragic to me is that she is kind of convinced by it, like what, like Christine that is. And, and mm-hmm. this like dinner scene or whatever it is when they're having these conversations, she does seem genuinely happy that she has a face again and that she can have this fresh start and then it's taken away from her. I think the idea to me is that for the rest of the movie, she's then forced to reconcile with the fact that she was happy about it for a little bit 
and that'll just make her feel more guilty about what they're doing to other people to give her this face. Uh, yeah. Because what I was learning that earlier, that the detectives are useless. The detectives don't stop anything in this movie. They don't solve a thing. They get close where they should be able to like intervene and actually help someone, mm -hmm. but instead they actually put someone in danger and <laughs> go away thinking there's no mm -hmm. problem. It's Christine who saves the day. Christine makes a noble choice by the end of the movie, which saves someone's life and ends this nightmare uh, once and for all. So... Yeah, all, all, all that's great sort of stuff dramatically. Um, basically, Louise is out looking for more people and the police have started, the two detectives have started to notice that there's a pattern to the girls that are going missing. And they're like, hey, that shoplifter, we've got an idea. They're basically going to use her as bait. And it's actually when mm -hmm. they're talking to the fiancé who comes and speaks to them because Christine has for a second time in the movie called him. And you get the impression that she's calling them, like, maybe not every day, but often enough that he's getting used to these f weird phone calls where no one's speaking to him because he sounds quite <laughs> frustrated. But mm -hmm. you maybe get the idea that she just wants to hear his voice, that she's, like, missing him and wants to, like, just hear him say anything. And because she says something, she says his name, he recognizes the voice. So he goes to the police and says, hey, I heard her voice. This is weird, right? And they end up talking about the, these abductions, and the only details they have from like the the friends of the victims is that some woman with a pearl necklace uh, has like been involved in the abductions. And he's like, "Hey, that does sound like someone I know. Actually, that sounds like Louise. Mom. Shut oh. up. <laughs> it sounds like Louise, the uh, assistant character, uh, which we never mentioned this earlier, but she uh, like the reason why she's so devoted." to the doctor and helps him with all these murders is because she herself like had a damaged face that he fixed. Uh, mm -hmm. She's got a scar on her neck underneath the pearls that she wears. Uh, mm -hmm. well, that's why she wears them. She hides the, the, the one scar. So yeah, that's, that's her whole thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so, so they can talk, can talk this plan to submit this woman, the shoplifter into the clinic where the doctor works, that's his day job. Because he does have a job. He's not just at home all day doing crazy experiments on dogs. Like, <laughs> he does have, like, a regular doctor job as well. Mm -hmm. And the plan is, is to, like, oh, let's see what happens if we, we put her in here as a plan. But they don't seem to, like, actually keep watch and see if anything bad happens. Because when they do some tests and she's all right, and the doctor says, oh, just discharge her, she leaves the building and immediately Louise comes in with her car and says, hey, can I give you a lift? Kidnapping mm -hmm. her, because it cuts straight to her on the operating table with the line drawn around her face. Like, she's going to get her face cut off, right? <laughs> she's going go full Nicolas Cage with, with, with the face off. And I was like, wait, why wasn't there the police waiting outside to see if this was going to happen? And then the, the, uh, the, 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 the fiancé doctor, he, like, phones the police and says, hey... She she's left. Um, there was nothing wrong with her, so they they already like processed her and got rid of her. So the police are like, oh, we'll check and see if she got home okay. Oh, she didn't. Oh, the die. <laughs> What's happened there then? <laughs> like, if you're going to use an innocent young woman as bait, maybe just maybe actually have one person mm -hmm. keeping an eye on her, actually watching to see if something happens. I mean, I guess their assumption was is that if he was going to like kidnap her or do something, he'd do it from within the clinic. Mm -hmm. But clearly, the you know he's thought about that. That that could be tied to him too easily. <laughs> yeah, it feels like they kind of just came up with like the first part of the plan, and they were just like, "Well, that's we'll call it a day." Like I mean, I'm sure from here on out it'll work. Yeah, I mean, we get a big bit of attention here because they show up at the clinic to talk to him, and this is what interrupts mm -hmm. the surgery because you know Louise comes and gets the doctor and is like, "Hey, there's two policemen at the at the clinic, which is like next to his house." So he's like, oh, crap. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go speak to them. So that interrupts and saves her for, you know, that buys her some time. And he goes over mm -hmm. and he basically just convinces them. He gets, oh, yeah, here they are. Here's the paper. She was released earlier today. Mm -hmm. uh, once she's out that door, she's not my responsibility. And the policeman mm -hmm. and the fiancé go outside and basically say, oh, well, it was worth a try, wasn't it? And they shake hands and say <laughs> goodbye. And that, I'm like... Guys, she's literally on the operating table, like next door. She's she's about to get her face cut off. You're just 
plan. <laughs> you just get. I, I thought maybe. Oh, maybe they'll hear her scream or something. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, is it here where the, uh, Christine takes off the mask and looks at her? Maybe I was mixing it's that up right earlier. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I forget exactly when, but yeah, I said that was the first victim. Mm-hmm. It might be this victim. Maybe the shoplifter mm-hmm. girl. I can't remember. I'm, I'm maybe mixing mm-hmm. up two scenes there. But she. Uh, yeah, there's a great reveal here, though, with the camera in the operating room. Like, the doctor leaves, and the camera, mo- like, pans over to find Christine sitting in the room. And I thought this was a very interesting, like, detail, because earlier on in the film, she's so separate from all the surgery stuff, to the point mm-hmm. where she kind of has an idea that it's happening. She knows that her dad's up to stuff, but mm-hmm. she's very separate from it. She's not seeing it. She's been very coddled from the reality of what's been done to try and save her. And I thought it was interesting to hear for this victim, no, she's in the room. She is witnessing exactly the horrors that are happening mm-hmm. on her behalf. That she's not chosen for the record. This is something that her dad has decided to do for her. She's not mm-hmm. asking for this. And I think this was a, so, a you know, the, the sign that she is like, because the movie could have went obviously a couple of different directions here. But to me, this is the sign that she is watching this and she's taking it in and she's considering what she's about to do uh which ultimately is that she frees the shoplifter and mm-hmm. then frees all the dogs that are in kind of the room next to it and then the birds the doves as well uh, and this is where the dogs run outside doctor gets his comeuppance because the dogs all jump him and he's earned this death like he has absolutely earned these dogs because we see him there's it's a very satisfying yeah there's a quick scene earlier on where you see like a dog's like, like a square of like fur from a different dog so, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if you saw Poor Things yet, Tim, but it's a little bit Poor Things. I, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. just a, a more, you know, it's not the head or anything, but it's <laughs> it's uh, it's something. Yeah. So he he, he I, gets mauled, and the mm-hmm. final shot of the movie is is uh, Christine walking through the forest with the birds around her, and it's all like sort of very, it's very poetic, it's very kind of beautiful, and like she's kind of like free of not not literally the prison that as well, obviously, mm-hmm. but. Uh, she's free of the the hold that this man in this kind of like <laughs> obsession with how she looks. It feels like she's actually free to just live now. It, it's funny because I mean I don't know if this would have been as you know uh, like a uh, if that type of uh, iconography would have been you know as present at that time. But it feels like almost like a Disney princess kind of thing where like. You know, oh. she's walking through the forest and she has like birds, you know, like uh, on her. Like it, it reminds me, um, I don't know if like, not sure when Snow White came out, if it would have been, uh, I mean, that was then. Yeah, this is before, well, I think it was Snow White's before this. I want to say Snow White's like the 40s or something like that. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I guess it doesn't matter. Like, it, uh, yeah, it, I guess it just throws me off because like that's in color and that's in black and white, but I guess like, you know, animation is a very different thing yep. well there was movies in color before this as well it's just that it was more mm-hmm. expensive <laughs> to do That's that true. so <clears throat> um but i know I, I just yeah i thought that was like a very interesting um dichotomy of like yeah kind of you know it's a very like you know it, it, it's like that kind of disney princess look but you know well, a, a more kind of dark twisted kind of way when you think about her character arc it is this mm-hmm. positive thing where I mean, earlier on in the film, she literally says she wants to die. She wants to kill herself to, <laughs> to because she she asked Louise, "Can you go get me some of the the stuff that you give to the dogs and pump me full of it so I die?" And <laughs> she's like, "Oh, you can't think like that and whatever." But by the end of the movie, it feels like she's more accepting of who she is. So it's kind of <laughs> like she, she's over it. like this obsession that everyone else seems to have. Because it's like you said earlier, like the dad's <laughs> supposed to say, "Oh no, you're beautiful no matter what. I accept <laughs> you for who you are." Instead, he's like. I can fix you. You're you're broken, and I can fix you. <laughs> <laughs> He's toxic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. I mean that, that's uh, that's very interesting. And then uh, I mean she becomes pretty badass uh, by the end. It, it's pretty cool. And um, yeah, like kind of talking about how you know it, it, important it is to show her yeah you know, actually being like in the room and seeing what's being done. Like uh, yeah, I feel like you can kind of you know uh make some like metaphors to like you know like how we just very mindlessly like consume stuff and not really worry about where it comes from but once you're actually Mm. seeing like 
oh like this is the price i'm paying for like you know the the beautiful face i want like it's easier when you know your dad is just telling you oh yeah like you know i'll do it or, or whatever and not to say that she's not like you know completely innocent uh, like you know but like uh I mean, once you're he, actually there and seeing he's literally testing on animals which is something that yeah. beauty products have traditionally been notorious for is the idea <laughs> of being t being uh, animal tested so yeah, yeah. I, I can see that comparison like, that works and then uh and then too, I, I was also pretty, uh, again, kind of just shocked by like how blunt uh, the violence is when uh, she actually ends up killing uh, Louise. Like she just stabs her with the, I think it's just a scalpel. Yeah. Well, that's not Christine. Oh. That's um, that's a shoplifter girl who stabs her. Oh. Oh. Okay. Positive. Oh no! No! No, uh, no! No! You're right. Actually, you're right. I. They're both in the room, but I, I yeah, think yeah, like, it's Christine that stabs her. Sorry, you. I think you're right. Because yeah, she, she like freezer like she uses that to cut off her yeah, yeah, restraints right. or whatever, um, but then I, again I guess I'm just used to more like, you know like the Universal Monster movies or something where like yeah if they weren't gonna do like a bit of violence like stabbing someone that they would you know do it like off screen or like you'd show them you know about to do it and then it would cut away or something but like you see like you know the thing like sticking out of her <laughs> like what? as. Which is surprising. And even shoot it in a way where they're, they're expecting you to be surprised by it. Because the actual impact, mm -hmm. the actual penetration happens when you're looking mm -hmm. at her back. So you don't see it. And mm -hmm. you think, oh, that's fine. That's all we're going to see because it's this time period. And then it mm -hmm. cuts to a shot of her front and the scalpel's just sticking out of her neck. And yeah, mm -hmm. I think there probably should be more blood. But this, you know, it still looks right. pretty, <laughs> you know, for, for the time period, it feels quite violent, like you say. Mm -hmm. So, like, this would probably be like, you know, watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like. <laughs> which I, I guess notoriously is not like the bloodiest movie but like you know at, at that time that felt like you know very shocking and then i'm sure watching this was kind of like that yeah for sure uh yeah that, that's a really standout moment um mm -hmm. like all, all the moments where the surgery stuff's happening mm -hmm. it re really stands out yeah uh yeah like this whole last section i was you know uh very into like it it's uh like it, it moves very quickly and just like it, it, there's a lot of stuff i was like oh shit oh shit oh shit and then like yeah and then you know leading up to like the the dog attack like again i was very surprised at how like brutal <laughs> that looked yeah it's a crescendo although i'm curious mm -hmm. when are you counting the start of this last bit are you, are you counting the, the face cutting off of the previous victim because that's like probably a good half hour or so before the end i would say uh i mean i guess just this last little chunk of like you know um basically I guess when, yeah, maybe he's about to do the the surgery, and then like you know the cops interrupt it, but then like she frees the, the person. So, all all this stuff like around like the last victim and freeing her and then killing everyone basically. Yeah, as much as I'm joking about the cops being useless and just leaving because I'm I'm trained mm -hmm. in movies for them to like hear something at the last second and come running in right. and save them. It, it does make it a lot more poetic that it's Christine herself who solves everything. Like, she makes the choice, yeah. she breaks free and saves this this final victim. No one else is going to die in her name. Mm -hmm. uh, like, that that does all feel very, kind of, like, poetically dramatic, which is which is good. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. I, yeah, I mean, the, the overall themes of, like, the idea of, like, how, like, the fact that she wants to die because she's not beautiful anymore. And I think... Even the other characters like feed into that theme. Like when we go to the police station for the first time and we meet these two detectives, and they're talking about, oh, the women that are kidnapped are always the same beauty. And he's like, speaking of beauty, what do I do with a shoplifter over here? Like even they have a couple <laughs> of little, uh, just you know, like not super sexist comments, but just a little thing where they're like, oh no, this woman that I'm talking to for my job is defined by the fact mm -hmm. that she's attractive. That is something that comes up in these conversations. Um, <laughs> And it's this there kind of throughout. Um, Louise as well is is very much all about her face. She, she's loyal because he saved her beauty. That's how much of a slave she is to the idea of of being beautiful. Uh, so it it really paints this idea of like just how desperate people are to keep it. And like you say, you could translate that to like what they're willing to like ignore is happening to have their looks. And you could even extend that to something as you know broad as like being a vegetarian and like. You know, sure. yeah. like not not wanting to think about what's happening to the animals that are ultimately mm -hmm. ending up on the plate, kind of thing. Out of mind, yeah. out of sight. You know, so oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of parables you can make to like 
pretty much probably every modern convenience we have like <laughs> yeah uh, i'm you know <laughs> I, I, i'm on my phone all the time and uh, i'm sure if i stopped and think about you know whatever country uh is being forced to manufacture the microchips or whatever uh i'm sure it's all very unethical and horrible but uh yeah we turn blind eye to a lot of things because it makes life uh, a lot easier mm. yeah and yeah a lot of this is just beautiful i think the cinematography is uh phenomenal throughout uh, whether it's the quiet moments of christine going through the house or or the more frantic moments of, of uh, the victim with the bandages going through the house. All of that stuff is beautiful. The final shot of her going through the forest with the doves or the, the birds around her. Uh, like all, like there's, there's a lot of shots in this where you could say, hey, that's... you like Pause it, print it, put it on the wall. It, like You could frame mm-hmm. it and it would look good. Because it does. Uh, mm-hmm. al- almost any shot with Christina in it probably applies to that because of this. Again... Okay. It's this kind of like, like surreal, uncanny violinist of the mask, and just having the eyes come from this blank, expressionless face that's over the top. Mm-hmm. Really good stuff. Like I think this is a movie that the direction and the the haunting atmosphere, along with its themes, are really a lot of what 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 drives it. But it is surprisingly dark and violent in a couple of spots as mm-hmm. well. Uh, but it doesn't pull punches in quite the same way I'd expect something from nineteen sixty two. So, right. like, you know, if, if I'm compared to Psycho, because I don't think Psycho's the better movie. Like, Psycho is like a, mm-hmm. you know, masterpiece. But, like, this probably has the more shocking visuals in it, if I was to yeah. compare them. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, you know, Psych- Psycho has, like, some really good stuff, but it, it does feel like, yeah, maybe some of the stuff you would. I mean, I guess at the time, you know, it was pretty groundbreaking, but, you know, stuff like the shower scene, it's not like you're actually seeing the knife go in and, and stuff. No. And, you know. No. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's really well done how it is executed, but, like... Yeah. And that's not to say that we... It's not a knock, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's not to say that I'm ascribing value to just how violent or gory something is, but <laughs> this does stick out as being a lot further than just what I'd expect for the time period, so... Uh, and yeah, part of that is probably this outside of the US. It's somewhere else that, you know, was a bit more open to some <laughs> something grotesque, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's very good. Uh, the French extremity <laughs> craze <laughs> began here. Yeah, also, I mean, I have to say, like, the, the director here, Georges uh, Franu, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of that. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've seen anything else he has directed. Uh, I'm not <laughs> familiar with his other work. Uh, IMDb tells me he's known for Thomas the Imposter and Teresa Descaro. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation as well. Uh, this seems to be the movie that he made. It's just, you know, it, it's a cult classic that's, you know, well-loved by many. You mentioned King was inspired mm-hmm. by it. I suspect a lot of filmmakers that grew up in the 60s and 70s and started making movies in the 80s uh, probably are inspired by this. I'm sure, yeah. It's just it's one of those types of movies. I, I really can't recommend it enough. I think it's a great slow burn that builds at a nice pace to a lot of big stuff happening at the end. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, got, it's got a villain that's easy to hate, but he's not like comically villainous either. Like there's just enough of like realism to him that he doesn't just feel like a sure. maniacal movie villain. He feels like mm-hmm. uh, someone who is a little tortured by what he's doing, but is ultimately willing to just keep doing it. And that's what almost makes him more evil in a way he's like he's willing to live with the bad shit he's doing oh yeah there's something to that like um the banality of of evil uh, i suppose where it is just kind of like yeah he's just going through the motions you know you don't really see scenes of him being like tortured or or questioning what he's doing like you know like oh like i I hate it but I, i must do it for my daughter it's like yeah, like, he's just way too comfortable. Well, I think uh, part of the truth is, this is something I think Christine, the daughter, realizes as well, is that yeah, mm-hmm. it's not really for her. Like, that's a convenient excuse, but I think the challenge of pulling this off means more to him than her. That's you know, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, I think this is more about his work and his passion. It's all ego, it's all yeah, tied yeah. up in his work, and also, yeah, not wanting to have an uggo daughter. <laughs> yeah, that's the phrase he used. Uh, 
Uh, it's even implied at one point that he's kind of responsible for the car accident. Not so much that he intentionally did mm-hmm. this to her, but it was his own recklessness that, mm-hmm. that caused it. And that's another interesting little wrinkle to throw in there. That mm-hmm. may, I mean, you could argue that's maybe guilt's driving him. But I, I genuinely feel like th- th- it isn't really about her. He, he's just obsessed with what he's doing and pulling it off. Sure. Uh, and it's like, even if you succeed... This will never become legal. No one's going to like, <laughs> like. This is never going to be something you can actually practice out in the open or whatever. You're always just going to be the mad scientist behind closed doors doing this on the mm-hmm. on the lowdown. Uh, but you know, I, I compared it to Frankenstein a few times. You can compare it to, uh, you know, any of those sort of classic stories. Maybe even something like a. Uh, God, was it wasn't Strantz and Gildenstein are dead? Is that is that the story I'm thinking of? Uh, I, I know the title, but I'll, yeah. honestly, I don't really know much about it, about it. Yeah, maybe I'm not thinking of the right thing. But I, I, either way, like the, it definitely has some roots in like more classic stuff, uh, mm-hmm. while transporting it into a very, very modern interpretation. Because uh, mm-hmm. I mean, no, I mean, what, 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 what could, what is not a perfect taking of something that is vaguely Frankenstein-esque and saying? the modern version of that is doing it just purely for vanity than the sure. actual creation of life. Uh, of course, yeah. Th- th- there's something really beautifully dark about that and all, sadly rings true with the world. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, she needs to be, look good for her TikToks, you see. So she's got to have a nice face. Mm-hmm. So it works. So. Yeah. All right. Um, not that it, like, I mean, it, it it's two very different stories, but the the look was reminding me a, a little bit. Uh, I'm I'm just kind of thinking of it now because I'm thinking of like other stuff to compare it to, and uh, honestly, it's not really that good of a comparison. But uh, what jumped into my mind is I don't know if you remember that episode of Tales from the Crypt, uh, where there's like that really jerky guy and he hooks up with that girl on a Halloween, and they like both agree to like keep their like masks on or whatever while they're doing it and she has like this kind of like white porcelain mask uh, oh no on. wasn't this like the one good episode in the last three seasons it was like the only one we liked <laughs> i forget which season it was I, I do think it was one of the later ones but yeah it was like one of the like yeah actually good ones I, I think i remember it vaguely yeah um it really has nothing to do with it other than like oh like her face kind of had like a, a white mask looking kind of thing uh it is, is even super similar to this, but I don't know why it popped into my head. But I, I like that episode, so I wanted to bring it up. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> now, now you get to disappoint everyone, Tim, and rate the movie out of 10. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Again, I'm not trying to be negative or anything. I, like, I, like I said, I, I didn't hate her or anything. I just, uh, I, I liked it enough. I, you know, I just, you know, it obviously has a, a reputation of being a classic, uh, so... When I watched it, I was just like, okay, yeah, I, I, I get it. Um, I, I, I can see why people like it. It's uh, just not the kind of thing that I'm necessarily always into, which uh, if, if you want to call me a, a buffoon or, or whatever, <laughs> that's fine. Um, also, again, I don't know, just uh, there are times when I'm in the mood for these type of things, and, and maybe this was just a, an off week or whatever, but I, I can't deny, uh, like I said before, that... Um, there is some really striking and like, you know, beautiful haunting like imagery in it, uh, and just that, you know, that white mask face is just very, uh, you know, it's just it's just a very good look. And anytime that was on screen, it, um, it was definitely, you know, perked my interest. And uh, and and again, I, I like a you know a lot of the stuff in the end. That uh, yeah, I thought it was very good classic horror movie stuff, but. <laughs> again i can't deny that there was some earlier parts where um where it was just like a little slow for me and i was just kind of watching it going like oh, okay like yeah i see what you're doing there <laughs> like uh but yeah uh, i'm still gonna give it a, a decent score because like i said I, I think it's fine like i don't really have anything negative to say about it but i guess you know uh the you know <laughs> I, I didn't go to film school or study you know a fancy french <laughs> cinema so maybe I, i'm not appreciating it at the the level that it should be but I, i'm gonna i'm still gonna give it a, a seven 
So I, I think there's enough uh, cool haunting, you know, classic horror movie uh, stuff in there that you know is worth checking out and give it a you know recommendation. But yeah, that's uh, <laughs> about as far as I go, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I like obviously I've said most of what I need to say. I will add on here because I don't really talk about the performances that much. Mm -hmm. um, I think the actor playing the doctor uh, is very good. He's very sort of cold and calculated. Uh, I think the actress playing Christine has got a tough job because she has to do a lot of acting without most of her face <laughs> because she's in a mask <laughs> most of the time. So a lot of her performance, other than the eyes, of course, is her body language. It's her moving around the house. It's her how she's hesitant to do certain things or um, like the way she moves. Like, again, like you, you can some of it is creepy because of the mask and like you don't really know what she's going to do. And that's one of the things that's effective about the uh, like which is about to cut the, the final victim out of the, the, the straps is like you don't know what she's going to do with that scalpel. Like, part of you's yeah. thinking, oh, this is going to be a dark ending where she, like, goes full tilt like her father. <laughs> and instead, no, she cuts her free, and that ends up being what the, 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 the conclusion of her arc is. But, like, she has to do a lot of performing without a lot of the obvious, more normal, like, you know. She can't smirk. She can't, like, emote with her <laughs> mouth in any way uh, for pretty much all the movie, barring that one scene at the dinner table where she's got the face. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... Yeah, honestly, for me, I think it's beautiful. I think it's rich in themes. I think it's paced really well. I I think I am just about giving it the 9 out of 10. Wow. I, I think it's excellent. I highly recommend it. So, uh, I was nice. very nice for Tim's uh, top 100 vote winner that we did last month. and Well, yeah, I gave you Psycho Gorman. <laughs> Yes, I gave you eyes without a face. <laughs> yeah. Ah, <sighs> the people, the people <laughs> will be on my side. I'm sure they will. Mm. We'll see. Uh, I thought, I thought it was very fair. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything negative about it. I'm just, you know, I, I got to be honest. I'm just, you know, I'm not saying that I was like, oh my god, stop everything. I gotta, you know. Uh, write a blog about it or whatever. I, I don't know what people do when they like movies anymore. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh dear, mm. dear. All right, that's uh, I guess that's the show, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, next week uh, I think is the off week where patrons get the exclusive mm. episode. Uh, so if you're a patron next week, you can expect a little movie called Spookies. So. <laughs> look forward uh, to that bad boy uh, and then we will return for a regular episode the week after we'll be starting to chip away at 2024 movies with a January release by the name of Night Swim so look forward to that but that that is uh, what is coming up like I said you can support us over at patreon.com slash TV. get the exclusive episode like I mentioned for next week you get one every month uh, you also get other bonuses at the five dollar tier. You get even more stream segments where we'll do things like a random top five or Mount Rushmore. Or if there's a big news thing that we feel we should talk about, we may do an even more streams on that. Uh, it has to be a couple of those every month. So go and have a look. Plus, there's bonuses for all the other shows we do on Male Fuzz Movies. So go and have a look. But that is us. So thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching scary movies, and we will see you next time.